athletes in the world. Glenwood, the real beast Brown, who has had two title shots not too long ago. Let's take a look at the real beast. As Glenwood Brown looks into the future, he tries to envision happier times than he's had recently. He wants to erase his loss to Maurice Blocker and wants to wipe out his defeat at the hands of Meldrick Taylor. Both title shots. Still, Glenwood Brown can be happy that he is ranked as high as number three in the world and still has hopes of getting another title shot. He's trying to rebuild his confidence and get himself ready to challenge for the championship. He knows he can't afford to make a mistake. I think that's mostly what I have to do is worry about going inside the ring, uh, doing what I do, and worry about, you know, getting cut, getting butt or something like that. You know, I don't want nothing to set me back, especially a loss. A loss will set me back, you know, a couple of years. So, you know, you got to go in the ring, you got to look good, and you got to um, just take it to them and look impressive with it. You're coming back to a building where you really uh, scored a lot of lot of wins on your way up. Uh, what are your thoughts about coming back? Well, I'm looking forward to fighting back in the garden. I mean, I, I haven't been here for three years now. So, you know, I'm more excited about coming back here fighting in the, um, well, the Paramount now. And I'm, I'm just going to show everybody what I do. Are you at the stage now where people think of you more of um, well, a contender, but maybe, you know, maybe not, not able to, to get to the top. How do you think people perceive you? Well, you know, Benz, I had two title shots and I lost both of them. You know, people looking at me, well, this guy, he had the, the step to go up the ladder, but once he get to that title shot, you know, he just falls down. And, um, you know, I have to just prove them wrong. You know, the first time when I fought a blocker, you know, I felt that I, I got a little overexcited and I was looking to knock him out, so it backfired on me. Then when I fought Teller, you know, I felt that I won the fight, but, you know, you're fighting in his hometown, so you have to win oppressively or um, knock him out to win. So, uh, you know, I think I proved a lot when I fought Teller that I am uh, worthy as being a champion. But, um, you know, I'm just going back to the drawing board and wait till my chance come again and just do it this time. Ludwood Brown in the ring and getting ready for this matchup with Edwin Carrett. Let's get the official introductions from Ed Darius. Ladies and gentlemen, this next round is scheduled for 10 rounds and it's in the welterweight division. Referee is Luis Rivera. Introducing first in the blue corner, wearing the red trunks with the white trim. He weighed in at an even 150 pounds. Professionally, this young gentleman has 27 wins, 13 losses, 2 draws with 11 knockouts from Boston, Massachusetts. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome aboard Edwin Ray Couret. Couret. And his opponent in the red corner, wearing the black trunks with the red trim. Now this young pugilist has 36 wins, 3 losses with 26 knockouts. He is currently ranked number 3 by both the WBA and the WBC and number 8 by the IBF. The former USBA welterweight champion from Plainfield, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Glenwood, the real beast Brown. Brown. Glenwood Brown twice since his loss to Meldrick Taylor in January. Edwin Carrett, 32 years old, who uh, has been in with some top fighters uh, when he was in the lightweight division. Fought Robin Blake, Livingstone Bramble, went 10 rounds, lost decisions to them, lost a 12-round decision to Greg Haugen in 1986 for the NABF lightweight championship. Was stopped by Bramble in 88, lost a 10-round decision to Buddy McGirt here in New York in 1989. This is probably the heaviest weight that Edwin Cubitt has ever boxed at, uh, Sam. 
weighing 150, and it was very surprising that uh, Glenwood Brown came into this fight at uh, 154 pounds. Actually came to the scales at 155 and a half and had a loose, lost a pound and a half, and then by agreement with Edwin Curret, the fight was allowed to continue despite being over the weight for the original contract. Well, the way I understand it, uh, Edwin Curret uh, agreed to let the fight continue and go on, but he was compensated for it uh, monetarily out of Glenwood Brown's price, mm -hmm. the way I understand it. It's a very heavy weight for Brown. Well, you know, Sam, I, I've always said again about training fighters or training horses. Uh, if you train a horse, you lock them up in the stable at the end of the end of the night. But uh, fighters, I mean, you can send them out of that gymnasium, tell them what you want it to do. You want it to dry out. Uh, you want it to do this, that, and the other thing, and you don't know whether or not they do it. Somebody made a mistake with playing with Brown to have him come in that heavy for this fight. Brown landed a right hand. When he was in the lightweight division, he was, he was good, but not quite good enough to get to the top. He did get that NABF title shot against Greg Haugen and lost it. And was always competitive with the, the top fighters, but never quite good enough to beat them. And you mentioned Greg Haugen. Now I understand he's uh, Greg Haugen is going to fight the Julio Cesar Chavez. It looks like. I'm going to show you the directions that the guy's careers can take. And... Uh, I don't think that Greg Haugen uh, won an overwhelming uh, victory over Edwin Curran. Brown looks a little bit soft in the middle. Legs look strong. Arms look strong. He's a heavy puncher. And Curet also looks very soft in the middle. Coming to the end of round one. Two on two, Sam City, and I'm the mayor. Welcome back to Fight Night. Sam Rosen along with Gil Clancy here at ringside. Glad you're with us. At the Paramount at Madison Square Garden, Glenwood Brown in the black trunks. He's ranked number three in the world by the WBA and WBC in the welterweight division, which is 147 pounds. And he came in this morning at 155 and a half. Lost a pound and a half at the official weigh-in to 154, which is way over that uh, welterweight limit and up into the junior middleweight or super welterweight division. And there's been talk that uh, he may have to step up into that division, Gil. Well, Sam, you know, as fighters get a little older, they get a little more mature, they put on those few extra pounds. And uh, most fighters do gradually uh, graduate and move up. A good left hook by uh, Glenwood Brown. But both fighters look very sluggish up to this point, Sam. First man you could call a feel-out round, whatever you wanted to call it. But uh, neither guy showed too much uh, fire or ambition. Brown going to the body with a left hook. And Correct may be making a mistake if he tries to slug it out with Brown. Correct's been fighting professionally for 12 years. Turned pro in April of in August of 1980. Never has been, been a big puncher, Sam. I really don't think he has uh, the arsenal to hurt the Glenwood Brown. shots with Maurice Blocker and Meldrick Taylor October the 4th and then January 18th and lost both by 12 round decisions. Feels very strongly that he won the Taylor fight. He had Taylor down twice in that fight. Well he allowed Taylor to come on and at the end of the fight uh, he decided to, to try to outbox uh, Meldrick Taylor and I think that's what made the fight as close as it was. Direct straight for the right hand to the body a couple of times in this round. 
those body shots that forced Perrette to back up a little bit. He's felt them. He's shaking his head into his corner, nodding. He's okay, but I think the body shots have bothered him a little bit. Lenwood Brown trying to southpaw yeah. just now. shots uh, in the last fight against Rocky Montoya that stopped that one early. Montoya did not come out for round three. Late in round two. Hello there, everybody. This is Matt. Out for round four. And Caret comes out straight at Brown, landing the straight right hand. There's blood uh, coming from somewhere, and Caret just got hit with a good left hook, but there's blood I, on Caret's left shoulder, so I, that blood's coming from somewhere. I thought, I wasn't sure, but I thought there might have been a little cut over the right eye of Glenwood Brown. I wasn't sure if it was uh, sweat or blood trickling down the side of his face late in the third round. Well, Gavin did work on the right eye. Brown doing a lot of leaning on Caret. Brown has really been winging those punches, Sam, but most of them have been missing. Throwing big punches and fanning the air. Victor Valley wants him to use that jab, and he's thrown a few more here early in the fourth round. But he's gone away from the body shots, which were effective in the second round. Here's Corrette pressing Brown. but he's throwing very wide punches. In that overhand right, Tourette was trying to tie up the left hand. Tourette complaining to referee Louis Rivera. I don't know if it's about uh, Brown with his head down in the chest. And there's another example. Of Brown is the stronger guy, and he allowed uh, Curet to push him right across the ring, from one side of the ropes to the other. Louis Rivera telling both fighters it up a little bit. There's been a lot of holding, much action. Right, tying up that left hand of Brown on the inside. Curet, uh, again, has been around. He's been in with the best. He's a cutie in there. Good short. Short left hook by Curet. Beat Glenwood Brown to the punch. Brown trying to find an opening. Switch to southpaw again briefly. We're late in round four. The legendary. Last July, Kelly Davis of Arlington was. Round five scheduled for ten. Officially, these are welterweights in the ring, though they're over the weight limit for this bout. Glenwood Brown in the black trunks, Edwin Corrette in the red. Check of Guild scorecard, and we find. I have it to 2 1 1 Glenwood Brown. one-point lead. I've got him with a three-point lead. Not even much sustained action here. Not at all. Sam. 
Jones took the initiative away from Brown. Brown was just starting to get to him with the first good solid punches he landed. the momentum, but why can't Brown pick it up now? Well, here, I just saw Brown was content to grab a hold. Uh, Curette missed two punches. He should be sharp and counter punching. Instead, he grabbed the hold of uh, Curette, and he held Curette. So I guess if Edward Brown hopes to win the welterweight championship, he's going to have to fight a lot better than this, a lot sharper than this. Soon we're going to be hearing it from the gallery, Sam. And uh, Victor Valley is shouting from the corner, use your jab, use your jab, and Glenn was paying no attention whatsoever. Brown ducks down, takes no action. something. What is he trying to do? And we've seen Glenwood Brown do this several times in fights where he clearly has the advantage and doesn't take it. And you, you called it right on the button, Gil. The, some boos coming up from the crowd here at the Paramount. You shift him, but you're not doing it. You're weaving and you're not throwing no punches. You must throw the jab. You must use that jab side to side. You use the jab fast. You gotta, you gotta take the jump on this guy fast. You're waiting a little too long to, to deliver. That's start, start going now in this round. Get the jab, run the jab, you're hooking the body and hooking the chin. You gotta bend and hook in the body and hook in the chin. Forget the right hand, hit him with the right hand. say you don't fight you don't win and Glenwood Brown getting plenty of instructions from Victor Valley as uh, we're in round six and joining us at ringside good to see him here as uh, heavyweight contender Alex Stewart Alex how you doing well, I'm doing okay it's nice to be here all right you've got a cast on your hand what uh, what's going on well I'm gonna um fix um, my hand I heard it in the last fight Tomorrow. How long of a layoff is that going to be for you? I think about three months. Three months would be basically three months. Set back your timetable at all for uh, getting a shot at one of the top contenders? Well, I think I have to wait till let me sort out the four heavyweights in the top. You know, I was going to fight. So, you know, I was going to stay busy, keep on waiting to be the next one in line. So, um, right now, yeah, it's a break. It's Glenwood here that he just, just ain't putting it together yet. He's hitting him with one big shot and then he stops and ties him up. He hasn't hit him with too many one big shots in the entire fight, there. Alex, maybe two or three. Why did he come in so heavy today for a fight that was contracted for 150 pounds and weighed 155 and a half? Well, I think it's, um, he had, um, had a layoff. And um, because of the layoff, he, had, he got hurt, and then um, he started to train back again and recovering. He put on the weight while he was, you know, recovering. Yeah, but don't don't you weigh out in the gym every day? I mean, didn't didn't anybody have like, any idea how much you weighed when you signed the contract for a fight? Yeah, but um, what happened with them was them was to eat a lot. I think he doesn't miss too many stacks. <laughs> See, that, that's what we're talking about, locking those horses up yeah. in the stable, Sam. Is his hand still bothering him, Alex? No, he's pretty 
because I think um, right now Glenwood, he, he had to lose a little bit of weight for this fight, so he, he didn't be too sharp, and he's more he's more concerned about just knocking the guy out. But he isn't really doing nothing yet. I think once he started to lay his hand go, he finally he'll come right away. Heavyweight contender Alex Stewart joining us at ringside, and Alex is a stablemate of Glenwood Brown, offering his insight. What do you make of the uh, the Holyfield Bow fight? I think it's going to be a very interesting fight. You know, I think um, Rick Bow hasn't really been hurt yet, apart from when Biggs hit him. And um, it's going to be pretty interesting to see how um, Holyfield takes it to him. Coming down to the final seconds of round six. Sports Illustrated gets you ready for the excitement of NFL. Sam Rosen, Gil Clancy, and heavyweight contender Alex Stewart joining us as we watch Walter Wade's Glenwood Brown and Edwin Carrett go into round seven. How do you have it scored, Gil? I have it dead even. Uh, Sam Carrett's a, a no puncher, but he's landing maybe six or seven punches around, like the last round, and Glenwood landed maybe two. Hmm. I haven't given Carrett anything more than two even rounds. Well, the rest have gone to Brown. Well, maybe let's watch the fight a little closer because Glenwood looks menacing in there. But now those are two of the first punches he landed. You may be giving him credit for menace. I could be. But I mean, he has to score some points. He has to hit the other guy. Victor Valley has the right idea because that jab working is a good left hook by Glenwood Brown. And Cuvette just shook his head no. But at least he landed the punch. I just don't see Correct doing anything either. Well, in the last round, he just threw a couple of little combinations, three or four of them, and I thought that was enough to get the edge out the round. All right, back into the heavyweight division. Alex, what do you make of uh, Razor Ruddick and Lennox Lewis? That comes up uh, October 31st before Bo and Holyfield. Well, I, I believe that um, it's Razor Ruddick catching with that upright cut. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be over for Lennox. I think he's a little bit it too, too, too early. But it could be a very interesting fight. If he can catch him with the right hand while he lowers his arm left, it could be, it could be the other way around. And uh, where do you fit into the picture once you get your hand uh, fixed? Where do you fit in? Well, I think they're looking for somebody who they think they can get, get a fight with pretty easy with no competition. And I think I'll be right there. Plus, um, I'll be, be right in the thick of the fight for a mandatory. So okay. I'll be like, you know, if you eliminate three, so I'll be like either third or number two. So we'll just wait for the world title shot. All right. Bye. Look forward to that. Stay with us a little longer and watch Glenwood and give us uh, your thoughts. Well, I think it's like Gil said, you know, he's got to throw a lot more punches. And, um, he's just doing just enough. Maybe not. I don't know. You Gil, you think Garrett's taking taking the round away from him? No, I, I thought that uh, Glenwood had a good beginning of the round, but uh, again, he's just not throwing enough punches. Garrett just landed a little three-punch combination inside. It doesn't look like much, but they score points. So again, it's up to the judges, but uh, Big Glenwood comes in with those big punches, and uh, they may be impressing the judges a little more. They better hope so. Time is winding down. There's a good left hook yeah. on the ground. And Kuret came back with two good body punches. Round eight, scheduled for ten. Glenwood Brown in the black trunks. Edwin Kuret in the red. Alex Stewart has joined us at ringside. Alex, the two title losses that Glenwood had with uh, Maurice Blocker and Meldrick Taylor, how much did they affect him mentally? Well, I think the, um, the first one, the one he lost was um, Blocker, he, he didn't stick to his game plan. I mean, he went out, they went wild, and he was trying a lot of wide punches. Like today, he's trying a lot of wide punches and very few straight punches. He's relying just on that big left hook. Him. So he came back and when he fought Major Taylor, the second, the second title fight, he did a wonderful job. But then he eased up in the later rounds and led back into the fight. So, um, you know, right now, you know, Glenwood, it depends which Glenwood shows up. I mean, he could be a world title holder today if he just kept on focus. All right. 
You heard it from Glenwood stablemate, Alex Stewart. I thought the same thing in the Melvin Taylor fight. I thought he had to fight one, but instead of going out and taking the last couple of rounds, he allowed trying to outbox Melvin Taylor, a guy with faster hands and shorter punches, and he allowed Taylor back into the fight. That's what gave Taylor the decision. Also, I felt like the home crowd was there too, so that yeah. gave take You have to understand pressure. all of that before you go in the ring. You know that that's there, so you know you have to really win it. Because if he was over here, I think he'd have definitely got the decision. You gotta work, you gotta work. And knocked him down twice. He had him hurt. Len was absolutely really doing nothing in this in this round at all. He's letting Caret stay around. He's not taking charge of the rounds. And Caret cute on the inside, tying up the left hand of Brown. And here he turned he turned the gun around and put him back in the corner again. from a crowd-pleasing fight. And again, as I, I said earlier, Glenwood Brown hopes to become world champion. He must fight a lot better than this. Here's that good left hook, but again, it's in the air. I think also you have that time. He fights a lot better with, with, with like world contenders, you know. And um, he raises up to the contention. So when he fought Medrick, he was right there. Yeah. He was a bigger thing. I think he may overlook this guy. Thinking ahead. Alex, want to thank you for coming. Uh, good luck with the hand surgery, and uh, can't wait to see you back in the ring. Oh, I'm looking forward to be back here. Okay. Thank you very much, Rich. Thanks, Tim. Hey. Heavyweight contender Alex Stewart joining us. Right here, we come to the end of round eight. We'll be back with more fight night in just a moment. If you're concerned about your thinning hair, call Hair Club for Men and receive our free brochure. Learn how Hair Club's non-surgical polyfuse method gives you the freedom you've always wanted. Your new hair will look and feel like a part of you. I did not ask to lose my hair. And for a long period of time, I thought that I would have no choice. And with Hair Club, I do have that choice. I like that. No matter what sport or activity you enjoy, you'll feel secure and confident with your new hair. I was uncomfortable when I didn't have hair. Now that I have a full head of hair, people that haven't seen me in a while, they don't even know I had anything done. It's like totally natural to them. Now I can walk down the street and not worry about the person standing right behind me or standing on, you know, waiting at a traffic light and the people are piling up behind me. And I think that everyone's looking down at the top of my head. So call for our free brochure to view our various hairstyles and receive information about Hair Club's non-surgical polyfuse method. And remember, I'm not only the Hair Club president, but I'm also a client. for round nine in a fight that has been lackluster. Welterweight contender Glenwood Brown has allowed Edwin Caret to stay around. And this fight, really, in, in recalling the fight that uh, that Buddy McGirt had with Edwin Caret, very similar to it. Caret, the, the cutie, hangs around. He holds you a little bit. He, he pit pats you a little bit. And he's still there. The thing is, Linwood, uh, each round, uh, Sam, is so uh, difficult to score. You're, in, you're inclined to give them to Glenwood because of his ranking and everything else, but uh, he's really not doing anything. Neither guy, I mean, at the end of the round, you say to yourself, who won the round? No, because nothing's happening. So how do you have it scored? I have Glenwood Brown ahead four rounds to two and two even. Okay. I've got a four-point lead for Brown, 79-75. We're giving Correct one round and two rounds even. So we got a five. But you can just see five, one, two. There's really nothing happening. All of a sudden, Curet will come up with a little flurry, and you, because of its Glenwood Brown, you say, "Oh, he's not really hurting Glenwood." There's a four-punch combination. He's scoring. A guy like Curet, at the end of his career, he's become an opponent. For him to be around in the ninth round is quite an accomplishment mm -hmm. against a bomb like Glenwood. His tremendous experience, as we mentioned, 12 years of pro, and has fought world, world class fighters many times. Combination by Glenwood Brown, left hook to the chin by Brown. 
guess the one thing that disturbs me about Glenwood Brown, Gil, is that he gets the right instructions from the corner and doesn't carry them out in the ring. That's exactly right. I mean, Victor Valley's is telling you, stick that left jab out, stick the jab out, then go to the body and head with the left hook. If you get the right hand. Brown leaning through the ropes, forced back by Curette. to see Nolan strike out Pete Rhodes. Well, you know, my favorite is the 5,000 strikeout. He struck him out swinging! Cool. But what about Nolan's seventh no-hitter? your copy of Nolan Ryan's official video history, Feel the Heat. Call 1-800-334-9900 and receive a Feel the Heat t-shirt absolutely free. Facing the Nolan Ryan fastball is like trying to drink coffee with a fork. Is that Reggie Jackson? It sure is. And, and look, Nolan's giving away his pitching like secrets. But Grandpa, the coolest part is this Ryan can. Out for the final round. There have been no knockdowns. There's been uh, very little sustained action. Very few... Solid punches landed. It's not been a crowd pleaser. Here's Brown aggressive. He did get nailed by a quick left hook by Curette. That nail walking in. Forgot that Curette can still throw punches. Still to come is our main event. Scheduled 12 rounder for the USBA Bantamweight Championship. Junior Jones, the number one contender in the world. And the USBA title holder taking on Eddie Rangel of San Antonio, Texas. That's coming up next. Correct. Complaining for the referee, perhaps again about Brown's head underneath his chin. Correct tying up that left hand of Glenwood Brown. Now you can see why Curet has gone the distance with so many good, two good solid punches by Edwin Curet, but you can see why he's gone the distance with so many good uh, outstanding fighters. And now he's throwing the combinations. He's doing the guy, he's the guy that's landing the punches in this round. This is very reminiscent of the fight with Buddy McGirt in 1989. Time has been uh, stopped. Tape has come down off the left glove of Glenwood Brown. And now Gavin will some work on it. Look at it, I like it. And some work on the right glove as well. Bach back in motion. With a minute and a half to go in the fight. this one off my list of uh, contenders for the brute fight of the night. Correct pressing the attack. This is Correct's best round, I think, Gil. I think so, too. He's landed some good, solid punches in this round. has come down off another glove. Let's say that's Brown's left glove. Oh, Rivera is thinking of stopping the action. Now he does with 31 seconds remaining in the round. Alright, here we go. Brown up 
upset because this has not been uh, a good fight to watch. A lot of grappling, a lot of holding. I think the fans have been very patient. If you ask me, I've seen them pull a lot more, a lot better fights than this. Well, like most fight fans, and I throw myself in here too, I, when you see a world contender, you expect a lot more. Final seconds of the fight. That's it. And you can hear the crowd reaction. You know something, I have him winning. All right, Gil, what do you think? Brown by two points. Okay, I went uh, Brown by four. They were paying attention. I'm telling you that Brown got, Brown got points in the rounds. I gave him rounds myself, which I shouldn't because he's brown, because he didn't do anything in the fight. On reputation? You yeah. think judges do that, Gil? Absolutely. Okay. Edwin Carrette posing for the cameraman at ringside. And uh, we await the scoring of the judges. As we mentioned, the main event is still to follow. Junior Jones and Eddie Rangel. Once again, far from his best. We've seen Glenwood Brown be a devastating puncher at times, tremendous body shots, and he just hasn't kept it up. He, he, there must be something in the air, because uh, Flacco Negron looked uh, just about the same kind of performance that uh, Glenwood Brown put on tonight. Ed Darian surveying the scorecards. The announcement of the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a split decision and a scoring by points as follows. Judge Harold Letterman deserved 97 93 Brown. Judge Barbara Perez, she watched it, 97-93, Couret. Yeah! And Judge Steve Weisfeld, he scored it, 96-94. For the winner, by split decision, yeah! Edwin Ray Couret. Wow, Couret. how do you like that? Edwin Couret yeah! has won the decision. And you're, you're right on the money there, Gil, as far as I told you, Sam, I gave Brown a couple of rounds myself because it was Glenwood Brown, but I could see what was happening in there. He wasn't effective, he wasn't scoring, he really wasn't doing too much of anything. And you can see the diversity of the scoring. One judge going two points for Caret, Barbara Perez going four points for Caret, and Harold Letterman going completely opposite, four points for Glenwood Brown. Uh, it was that kind of fight, Sam. Every round, at the end of the round, you say, well, who should I give the round to? Who do I like better? Wow, that's a stunning, stunning outcome. The number three ranked welterweight in the world, Glenwood Brown, is beaten in his home area, the New York metropolitan area. He is from New Jersey, and Edwin Carrett coming down to Madison Square Garden from Boston. Man who's on the downside of his lengthy career, and he wins a stunning split decision over Glenwood Brown. When I saw Commissioner Gordon go into the ring before they read the scorecard, I seemed to think that there may have been some reason why he jumped in there. Glenwood Brown dejected, but he just didn't do much. And the judges go for Edwin Carrett in a split decision. A shocking victory for Edwin Carrett. Coming up is our main event for the USBA Bantamweight Championship, Junior Jones and Eddie Rangel. Okay, so we were having a good time after work when this older guy walks up and orders a Bud. Give me a Budweiser. One could have been a coincidence. Yeah, but then... Budweiser. 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 Whoa. Think about it. We like Bud. They like Bud. Yeah, could it be we're really more alike than we thought? Oh, yeah. 
Obviously, this was going to require further study.